There's a lot of interesting developments in Venezuela right now. Bueno, de Venezuela, muy buenos días. Y sin con la integración cívico-militar caracterizada, la doctrina, la defensa. Why should we be interested in Venezuela in the first place? Well, Venezuela is an important country. It's the country that has the largest proven oil reserves in the, in the world. Uh, and that's one reason why we should be uh, interested in. But I think the second one is that it, it is the one place right now where the conflict between U.S. imperialism and uh, other countries is uh, at its uh, more, as sharpest uh, at the present time. Uh, as we speak, on Tuesday there was an attempted uh, coup uh, and the United States were fully behind it. And this is part of a, of a 20 year campaign against the Bolivarian Revolution. So, uh, yes, we should be interested. Plus, the British government is heavily involved in all these operations. Uh, the Bank of England is withholding 1.2 billion uh, US dollars in Venezuelan gold uh, illegally. And the British government has uh, thrown its weight behind the attempts by uh, the Trump administration to remove the democratically elected government in Venezuela. So, we, we, uh, we should be concerned. Why is the Maduro presidency in dispute at all? Yes, uh, there were presidential elections in Venezuela in May last year, so that's one year ago, and uh, a section of the opposition decided to boycott the elections. There had been a negotiating table in uh, the Dominican Republic with the participation of the former Spanish president Zapatero, and at these talks between the government of the opposition, the opposition insisted that they wanted early presidential elections. Finally, the government agreed to this, a date was set, but at the last minute, the Venezuelan opposition got a phone call from the United States and they said they shouldn't participate in these elections. So when the agreement was already uh, set and ready to be signed, they withdrew from the elections. Uh, and they actually, they actually divided over the issue. A section of the opposition decided to participate, and uh, Henry Falcon was uh, one of the opposition candidates, and another section of the opposition decided to boycott. And then they obviously said that the elections were not legitimate. But, but in fact, I think that if they had participated and the one single candidate, they would have stood a good chance of perhaps beating uh, Maduro. Um, how do you know that um, there was a phone call from America to not participate? Oh, this has been uh, revealed by people who participated in the, in the talks. Uh, they said openly that uh, uh, the government has said that there was a, a, a document uh, ready to be signed. And a number of journalists who were covering the negotiations have confirmed this. And they also confirmed that uh, the opposition at the very last minute, uh, or big section of the opposition, decided to withdraw from the from the talks, and on the same day there were a strong uh, statement by the Uni by United States officials saying that this agreement was not good, that the opposition should not participate, and the Venezuelan they opposition... Made, they, they made an official statement? Yes, and okay. the Venezuelan opposition has always been in the pocket of the US uh, administration, so it's quite likely, uh, that this, this is a quite likely story, I think. Um, on, on the topic of US involvement, what countries are um, most concerned about what's happening in Venezuela right now and for what reasons? I think the, the country that's most involved is the United States and this present attempt to remove Maduro uh, started at a very particular time in, in Latin America. We had the elections in Brazil in October and the election, the election of a far-right uh, government in Brazil. We also had a right-wing government in Chile a right-wing government in Colombia and they thought that this was the right time to intervene. But obviously there are two other governments that are interested, very, very involved in uh, Venezuela. One is China and the other one is Russia. These two uh, nations, these two co countries, have uh, investments in the oil uh, uh, industry in Venezuela, in mining and in other industries. And they have uh, lent large amounts of money to the Venezuelan government over the past 10 years. So they obviously have an interest in, uh, in uh, whichever government is in place in Venezuela, in them preserving their investments and the, and the joint ventures and the, and the access to Venezuelan oil. But didn't um, the US have um, similar investments in the Venezuelan oil industry before um, Hugo Chavez? The Venezuelan oil industry was nationalized in 1976 by the government of Carlos Andres uh, Pérez. But yes, over a period of time, uh, the state-owned oil company, PDVSA, became 
became uh, more and more was acting more and more like a private uh, company, like a, like a state within the state, uh, very autonomous from the government, and opening up to foreign uh, investment in terms which were not very beneficial for Venezuela and, and the Venezuelan government. So by 1998, when uh, President Chavez came to power. There were a whole number of uh, multinationals, mainly from the United States, but also French and others, that were involved in the oil industry. And uh, Chavez decided not, not to remove them from the industry, but to put terms in, in terms of the tax they were to pay, in terms of the percentage they could have in joint ventures that were more beneficial for the Venezuelan state. And obviously the, the United States were not particularly happy with that. Okay, so, so do you know the actual terms of the agreement before yes, and after the interference? Yeah, Venezuela, Venezuela uh, under Chavez, the terms for joint ventures will be that the state-owned oil company PDVSA will have a, a, a minimum of 60% of any joint uh, venture. So this reduced the, the terms for foreign oil, oil companies. Okay, so, so what was it before? Uh, before it could be anything, uh, a joint venture could be a minority stake by the state-owned oil company, there were no uh, limits. Okay, and would you say what this is the main reason why the US is... I'd say this is one of the main reasons, even, even uh, US National Security Advisor John Bolton said uh, a couple of months ago that uh, Venezuela had a lot of oil and it would be good if the US based companies were able to extract that oil. So that's clearly one of the reasons. I will say the other reason is the fact that in Venezuela there's been a revolution, i.e. the people have taken uh, the future into their own hands, there's been uh, nationalizations, experiences of workers' control, participation of the ordinary working people in the running of their own affairs. This is something the United States administration doesn't like. Uh, and wants to put an end to. And the third reason I will say is also an internal reason in the United States, that is that uh, President Trump wants or requires the support of the Republican right, uh, right wing of his own uh, party, based in uh, Miami, in Florida. And these people are very much in the, in the pockets of uh, Cuban counter-revolutionary exiles, Venezuela counter-revolutionary exiles. And so it's in the interest of uh, Bush, if he wants to win the 2020 election, to uh, have the vote of this particular section of the population in uh, Florida. And uh, by being very belligerent against Venezuela and Cuba, he hopes to, he hopes to do that. Um, what, what is the state of the Venezuelan economy at the moment? Right now in Venezuela, there's a massive economic crisis that started about four or five years ago. Uh, there's been a, a massive collapse of the economy. Uh, GDP has gone down by over 50%. There's also hyperinflation. The situation of the economy is very bad. But I will say that sanctions, which the United States has implemented now, the seizure of assets, which the United States also implemented in February, is not helping the economy. It's making the whole situation even uh, worse. Now, many, many commentators have said, well, uh, particularly in the United States, they say, Venezuela is in an economic crisis. This proves that socialism doesn't work. This is the failure of socialism. But I will disagree fundamentally with that. First of all, because in Venezuela there's no socialism. There have, there have been nationalizations, there has been state intervention in the economy, but the economy is fundamentally a capitalist economy where, where the private sector dominates key sections of the economy, including the food, and this, food production and distribution, uh, the banking sector and many key strategic uh, industries. I will say on the contrary that the reason, main reason for the economic crisis in Venezuela is the fact that the government tried to regulate the economy by introducing price controls, by introducing foreign exchange controls. And in my opinion, the capitalist economy cannot be regulated. Either you leave the market to run normally and then the capitalists benefit, or you, or you take them over, you nationalize the economy and you run it in the benefit of the, of the majority. The attempt to do a halfway house is what's really created economic sabotage, the flight of capital, an investment strike. And this has obviously been aggravated by sanctions, which uh, were introduced by both the Obama administration and now the Trump administration, a blockade on uh, the oil sales, the seizure of assets, economic sabotage and so on. But the root cause is the attempt to regulate the capitalist economy. Uh, and this leads capitalists to not want to invest, to uh, organize a black market, to sabotage the economy and, and so on. Um, 
What is the reception by the people of Venezuela to the current government that's in there, Maduro? Yes, the, the Venezuelan population has given widespread, overwhelming support to the Bolivarian Revolution for the last 20 years. In Venezuela, there have been 24 different elections, referendums and regional elections, presidential elections since 1998, when Chávez was elected for the first time. But it's clear that as of 2014, 2015, support for the Bolivarian Revolution started to decrease uh, progressively with the economic crisis. People with, were becoming disillusioned with the government and so on. And uh, in 2015, the opposition won for the first time the National Assembly elections, won a majority in those uh, elections. This was the first election that the opposition won, with the exception of a constitutional referendum uh, a few years earlier. Uh, but I will say that there is still a large reservoir of support for the Maduro government. But even beyond support for the Maduro government, there's a large opposition to any imperialist intervention in Venezuela. There are people who are critical with the government, but they do not think that Guaidó coming to power on the back of a US-backed uh, coup is the solution for the problems in the, in the country, quite, quite clearly. And <coughs> Sorry, despite the fact that the media have not reported on this, even in the last two or three months, four months uh, since this coup started, coup attempt started, there have been massive demonstrations in Caracas and in other parts of the country in favor of the Bolivarian Revolution and against US imperialist uh, intervention. Um. I but, but I have to say that the situation is obviously very polarized. The opposition is able to put a lot of people on the streets and they also have support from a section of the, of the population. Um, Hugo Chavez, um, I remember back in the day, he used to um, hold a show where he talks directly to the people yes. and they can question him about what's going on in the country. Um, I don't know if Majuro has any um, similar um, pro like programs that happen as well. Yeah, Ch Chavez became very popular because he was talking the same language as ordinary working people in the street, in the barrios, in the neighborhoods and so on. And one of the ways he communicated was through this Allo Presidente program, which was every Sunday. It went on for a few hours and he held it in front of a live audience. There were live questions from the public and so on. Uh, this program finished with Chavez. Uh, Maduro doesn't have a similar program, but he, he does address the, the public on a number of occasions, on the telly and so on. Uh, I would say that Maduro doesn't have the same charisma as Chavez, plus also he's had a, a bad hand, that he's, dealt, uh, he's been dealt a, a very bad hand, you know, I mean, he started, came to power at the time when the economic crisis started. Uh, Venezuela was hit by a massive collapse in the oil prices. Venezuelan oil was over $100 uh, dollars a barrel in 2013-14 and then went down to 27 is now recovered slightly, but, but still uh, it was a, a worse situation than the one that uh, Chavez had. But if I have to make a criticism of Maduro, many people say Maduro is a dictator or is an authoritarian uh, leader or whatever. I will say if there is a criticism of Maduro is that he has been too lenient with the opposition. He's attempted to make compromises with the capitalist class. He's made concessions to the capitalists who are sabotaging the economy. Like, for instance, he says there is an economic war going on against my government and the Bolivarian Revolution, which is true. But then the question uh, to be asked is then why, why uh, this opposition uh, carrying out illegal actions is still in control of key sections of the economy? Or even now, uh, Guaidó uh, has declared himself president with no legal basis. He has called on the military to remove the government. He participated in a military coup on, on Tuesday, and he is still free to walk the streets. Uh, he's not been arrested. He called for a foreign military intervention, and, uh, and yesterday he was at the May Day opposition march, uh, calling on people to rebel against the government. I mean, in any other country, he will be arrested and put on trial for, so for, why, why, for, so for treason. And <laughs> so why do you think he hasn't been arrested? Uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, I, I will. I will. Have, have they issued an arrest warrant for him? Not yet. Not yet. I think, I think he should be arrested, it's quite clear. The only way to deal with this undemocratic uh, pro-coup opposition is by, uh, with, with the full force of, of the law. And any attempt to make compromises, to make uh, concessions to the opposition have backfired for the last 15 or 20 years. I don't think that's the way, I don't think that's the way forward at, at all. Um, 
What would you say is the political awareness level of the common people in Venezuela? I think it's very high. The 20 years of the Bolivarian Revolution have created a very politically aware population. Uh, for the first time, uh, I mean, Chavez in this program that you mentioned, Alo Presidente, he did things like he went in front of a live audience uh, in a televised program and he had a map of the country and he explained clearly this country is very wealthy. We have uh, gold, we have uh, oil here and there, we have uh, bio natural reserves and everything. And the reason why the people are poor is not because the country is poor, but because the wealth is in the hands of a small uh, minority, the oligarchy, and uh, we, we need to put an end to this. So, so through this, uh, a massive political education came about. People were organized in the neighborhoods, in the, work, in the workplaces. There were workers' control, workers' committees, revolutionary trade unions, the peasants took over the land. And so this is why people do not want to give that up. They have something to defend and they want to defend the revolution and the legacy of uh, Chavez. This is why it's been so difficult for the opposition to penetrate the working class and poor areas in the capital and in other parts of the country. And uh, despite what the media say, media say Maduro is on his last legs, he has no support, he's lost all support from the population. This is not really true. Uh, and it is down precisely to the very high political level of uh, awareness of the population in Venezuela, particularly over issues like imperialism, the importance of uh, the oil uh, in the economy, uh, and the need for direct participation of the people, as opposed to bourgeois democracy, where you vote every four years and, and that's it. Uh, so yes, I would say there's a very high political level in the country. So who are the people that are fighting in the streets against Maduro that's being reported to be fighting against If you, Yeah, that's true. If you, if you look at the map of the capital, Caracas, you will see that there's two, the, the, most of the opposition demonstrations take place in the east of the, of the city, in places like uh, Altamira, Chacao, Chacaito. Uh, and these are strongholds of the opposition where mainly middle class and middle upper class people live in the west of the city, in places like El Valle, uh, Antimano, 23 de Enero and so on. These are working class and poor areas where support for the, for the government and for Chavismo in general is much higher. So the polarization in the country <coughs> and in the city is along uh, class lines. The, the, the more higher up you are in the social scale, the more likely you are to be a supporter of the opposition and vice versa. And what is the relationship what, what, what's the response from the um, surrounding countries to what's happening in Venezuela right now? Well, of course, uh, <coughs> sorry, of course, Brazil and Colombia have right-wing governments and they've been very belligerent against, uh, <coughs> against Venezuela. <coughs> the president of Brazil, Bolsonaro, has said that he will be prepared to, to launch a military invasion, although the Brazilian army is not so keen. And the Venezuelan government, the Colombian government, sorry, which is a government that's linked to paramilitary gangs, extrajudicial execution of popular leaders, peasant leaders, indigenous leaders, trade union leaders. This is a government that's very belligerent, have been, has been very belligerent of, against the, the Venezuelan revolution for 20 years. And they are part of this conspiracy to remove the government of uh, Venezuela. At the end of the day, you can have any opinion you want about the Maduro government, but the point is that uh, surely it's a, it's a basic principle that the Venezuelan people should be allowed to decide who's the, uh, who's the president of Venezuela, not Trump or Duque, the Colombian president, or Bolsonaro, the Brazilian uh, president. So what, what are they given reasons for wanting to intervene in what's happening in Venezuela? Well, these are right-wing governments. Uh, they, they don't like the, the Bolivarian revolution. Their excuse, the excuse of these governments and also the US administration, they are saying, there's a humanitarian crisis in Venezuela. People are starving, uh, they, they need help, and the government is not giving them help, so we need intervention. But this makes no sense. And they also say we need to restore democracy in Venezuela. This makes no sense, because if you look at it, you, you see that there are many countries in the region where there, are, there is a humanitarian crisis, where people are, are, are suffering, where people are migrating uh, in large numbers, like for instance in Haiti or in Honduras. These, go these, these countries have governments that are not legitimate, that are not democratic. In Honduras there was a coup in 2009 that was supported by Hillary Clinton. And in Haiti there was an illegitimate government imposed by the United States. 
and uh, there's no talk of regime change, there's no talk of humanitarian crisis in this country, so it's completely hypocritical. And imperialism always looks for an excuse when they want to intervene in a country. When it was the time of Iraq, they talked about weapons of mass destruction, and that was a lie. When it was the time of Libya, they talked about an imminent massacre in Benghazi, and that was a lie. The, 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 the US, the, the, the UK, House of Commons Select Committee on Foreign Affairs has, has determined that that was a lie. And now they are making up a lie in order to justify intervention in Venezuela. If they were really worried about the humanitarian situation in, in Venezuela, and it's true there is a, there is a very serious economic crisis, they will uh, not impose sanctions. They will not prevent Venezuela from selling oil. They will not seize assets from Venezuela's oil company in the United States. And they will not be withholding 1.2 uh, billion uh, US dollars in gold in, in the Bank of England. That makes no, no sense as a policy and, and, it, and it makes their excuses a complete mockery. And what countries in the region are in support of um, the current government? In there's very, in there's very few, but I will say it's mainly the Cuban uh, government and the government in Bolivia that are supportive of, uh, of uh, Venezuela or the right of the Venezuelans to decide their own future. And also the, the new government in Mexico, the government of López Obrador, has also said that they want a negotiated solution to the crisis in Venezuela. They offer themselves to, uh, ho to host uh, talks and they say that there should be no foreign intervention in the internal affairs of uh, Venezuela. Um, Venezuela had a program, like I'm from Jamaica, well, I was born in England, but my parents are from Jamaica. And I know that um, Venezuela had a program called um, Petro Caribbean. Petro -Caribbean. Yeah. yeah, and um, Jamaica benefited from it. A, a lot of Caribbean countries in the region benefited from it. Um, what has been those countries' response to what's happening? The, the, the countries yeah. that have been benefiting from the programs that Hugo Chavez set up, what's been their response to what's happening? Yeah, in the, Pet the Petro Caribe program was set up to supply oil at preferential prices and uh, below the world market prices to a whole series of countries, mainly in the Caribbean, but even beyond the Caribbean. And uh, this, uh, in exchange for this, these governments will implement social programs in the poor neighborhoods and so on. Uh, some of these governments have come out in favor of uh, Maduro and against foreign intervention. For instance, at the Organization of American States, the United States has been unable to pass any votes against uh, Venezuela because of many of these Caribbean countries have uh, refused to, to vote, or some others have abstained. With perhaps the exception of Haiti, which benefited from the Petro Caribe program, but where the government really stole most of that money, most of that money from the Petro Caribe program didn't get to the people. And uh, the government is really also now facing a massive uh, uprising precisely on this, on this question of where is the money from the Petro Caribe program. And, uh, and that government is very much on the side of the United States against, against the Bolivarian uh, Revolution. Okay. I, um well, I think that's everything, you know. Um, okay, good. What, 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 what do you think are the implications of the outcome of um, Maduro staying in government and as opposed to um, Guaido taking, coming into yes. power? I think if Guaido uh, took power, it will be an unmitigated disaster for working people in Venezuela because his program, and he's already presented his program publicly, will be one of privatizing all of the state-owned industries, massive layoffs of public sector workers, the destruction of all the social programs, the return of the land that was confiscated from the big land owners to the big land owners and away from the poor peasants. Uh, he will carry out a policy of opening up the oil industry to foreign uh, intervention, to foreign multinationals at preferential, in preferential terms for the foreign multinationals. It will be a complete disaster. So I think that from that point of view, we must uh, oppose uh, Guaido and, and defend the Maduro government staying in power because it's been democratically uh, elected. However, I will say I am also critical of some of the policies of the Maduro government, as I said, because I think that his policy since he came to power has been one of uh, attempting to reach a deal with the opposition, uh, making concessions to the capitalists. And this is not really the way of defending and improving the conquests and the, of the revolution, the legacy of Hugo Chavez. When, when, before Hugo Chavez uh, died, uh, he made a number of speeches. And in, in these speeches, he said, look, we talk about socialism, but we still have capitalism. 
and we still need to advance towards a socialist economy. And he also said, we still have the old state apparatus, which is a bourgeois state apparatus. We need to pulverize that state apparatus and create a communal state. I will say that this is the way forward, a socialist economy and the destruction of the bourgeois state I, to complete the revolution along socialist uh, lines. If this is not done, I'm afraid that the Venezuelan revolution will still be in danger and the United States and the local uh, opposition, which is in the pockets of the United States, will not cease in their attempts to put an end to it. Because the one thing they cannot accept is the people having any real say over their own future and, and the handling of their own uh, affairs. And that is what the revolution is, is all about. I, um, one more question, or maybe two more questions. Yep. Um, since you brought up Guaido, um, why, why does he claim to be the pres interim president? Yes. And, he, and, who, and who supports him in the, in the world? Guaido is the president of the National Assembly. The National Assembly is dominated by the opposition. And then on the 10th... Was, was, was that legitimate? Yes, that was an election in 2015 where the opposition won a majority in the National Assembly. Okay. However, the National Assembly is in contempt of court, meaning that the, there are three MPs, three members of parliament, for the Amazon region, whose election was deemed to be fraudulent. And the Supreme Court of Justice and the, tri tri the Electoral Tribunal said that this election had to be repeated. The National Assembly refused. And so then the Supreme Court said, you are in contempt of court, any decisions you take will not be valid. But in any case, on the 10th of January this year, Maduro was sworn in for his new term of office after the election last year. And uh, the opposition said, we don't recognize this election because, because the election was fraudulent. And therefore, they say that according to the Constitution, if the president is absent, then the president of the National Assembly takes over. But the, the Constitution doesn't say that. First of all, the Constitution says if the president is absent on a permanent basis, which is not the case in Venezuela, the president is still there. Maduro is in the Miraflores presidential palace, he's not absent then the person to take over is the vice president, not the president of the National Assembly. The president of the National Assembly comes like third or fourth in, in the line of, of succession, so to speak, if all the other people are absent. So this has got no constitutional basis, but that's his, his argument for this. And uh, around the world, there is about 50 countries who have recognized Guaido, but as we know, in the United Nations, there's 190 countries, 170 countries. So they don't even have a majority of countries recognizing uh, Guaido. And in any case, Guaido has declared himself president on the 24th of January at a street rally. This is like, I mean, I'm in a street rally outside Downing Street and, and there's a, a big crowd and I say, look, I am, I am, the, I am the Queen of England. And uh, that doesn't make me the Queen of, uh, of England. The person who's in the Miraflores Palace is still uh, President Maduro. And so he has no legitimacy, no constitutional basis for his proclamation. But most important of all, he has no powers. I mean, he, he said, uh, on Tuesday he said, I am the supreme commander of the armed forces. But the armed forces didn't obey his orders. So de facto, he is not the, he is not the president. I mean, even there was a funny incident when the Spanish foreign affairs minister was asked, well, Spain has recognized Guaido. But who do you deal with if you have a diplomatic problem with, with a Spanish citizen in, in Caracas or anywhere in Venezuela? And he says, well, we have to deal with a government that has power, i.e. the government of Maduro. So that, that settles the, the matter. You, you, can, you can proclaim yourself to be whatever you want, but that doesn't make you, that doesn't make you the president of, uh, of Venezuela. So all of the countries that um, do rec recognize Guaido as the rightful president, do the um, Venezuelan embassies, how, how do they function there? The only country which has actually cut off diplomatic relations with Venezuela is uh, the United States. Venezuela expelled the United States ambassador and diplomatic staff, and the Un United States expelled the, the Venezuelan diplomatic staff. But all the other countries still have normal diplomatic relations. There are embassies in Caracas and so on. And, and they, they will work on behalf of Maduro? <coughs> uh, they don't work on behalf of Maduro, but they, 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 I mean, for instance, here in Britain, there is an embassy of Venezuela. Uh, Britain, the, the UK government says that they recognized Guaido. 
uh, and there is a person who calls herself the, the, the ambassador of Guaido in, in Britain, but it's not been recognized by the British government. And if the British government wants to do something in relation to the situation of, of a British citizen in Venezuela, they have to talk to the embassy of, of Maduro. Uh, Maduro's embassy because it's the only uh, real government that there is in, in Venezuela. It's, a, it's all farcical. I mean, this, this guy says he's the president, uh, but not even the media call him a president now. They, they used to call him a president back in January when, when he declared himself, uh, and then they started calling him the, the self-proclaimed president. Now they call him the leader of the opposition, and so basically everyone realizes that he's not really the, the president. And he, he came out um, two days ago, I think it was, with um, some military people yes. standing behind him. Who, and, and some guy that was released from, from prison or something yes. like that, or house arrest. Yes. Who are those people? When, like, yes, he, on, on Tuesday, uh, Guaido, just before dawn, he attempted a coup. Basically, surrounded himself with about 20 or 30 uh, soldiers. None of them were high-ranking officers. And uh, there was also this other person, Leopoldo López, who was uh, an opposition leader who was arrested after the violent and deadly rioting of the opposition in 2014, and he was under house arrest. So they basically managed to convince some people from the secret uh, service who were guarding his house to uh, release him, and uh, they managed to convince a number of troops to, to be in, on this video shot behind him. And he basically said they had command of uh, all the military units and that this was, a, this was a restoration of constitutional order and so on. But in reality, everything was a lie. First of all, he was not inside the military base where he said he was. He was just outside, uh, in the middle of the street, like we are here. Uh, he, his, the troops that he had behind him, most of them then realized that they had been deceived. They'd been told that they were going to be transported somewhere to put down a mass jailbreak. And uh, they were there under false pretenses, and most of them then went back and sided with the government. And then by the end of the day, 20 soldiers, 25 soldiers, uh, were asking for, uh, for political asylum in the, in the Brazilian embassy. And this guy, Leopoldo López, who had been released from his house arrest, is now in the Spanish embassy uh, seeking refuge. So the whole plan, the whole plot collapsed in less than 24 hours because, because Guaidó thought that he had the support of high-ranking military officers who didn't, support, didn't really support him. I don't know, the, the United States says that they were in conversations with high-ranking military officers. They had said that they would support the coup, but at the moment of truth, they didn't. So either they believed their own lies, because the opposition has been saying since January that they have support of the military officers, that in reality the army is with them and so on, but maybe they believed their own, uh, their own lies, or maybe they, uh, they uh, precipitated themselves into launching this coup before the time was ripe and all the conditions were ripe. But in any case, this was a very shambolic coup, because, I mean, if you, if you are to carry a military coup, you, you should have, at the very least, the support of some military units. You should take over control of uh, communications like a TV network or a radio station from which you can talk to the nation. You should arrest the president, uh, but none of this happened. It was a very uh, uh, shambolic coup and therefore collapsed in, in a very short space of time. So what's been the um, United States um, response to what's like the, the, the United the States? The United States immediately said that they supported Guaido that this was the restoration of freedom and democracy and the constitution. Uh, but obviously, by the end of the day, this wasn't the case and they were left with, with egg all over, all over their, their faces in reality. So, so have they not made no statement about what they're planning to do or if they plan to do anything at all? Uh, they have made statements, but they have made many statements since January and none of their plans have actually worked. They, they have now said all options are on the table. If it's necessary, there will even be a military intervention. Um, and they're obviously continuing with sanctions, which are very uh, damaging for the economy. I mean, the Venezuelan economy, the Venezuelan state depends on uh, oil for 90% of its hard currency income. And now the, the US has blocked any sales of oil from Venezuela to the United States. They have ceased. 
Oh, was, was the US um, Venezuela's main exporter? No, but it was one, one of the main. Regional. Yeah, the, the, I think the, the, they were selling about between 500 and 700,000 barrels of oil a day to the United States. So that's now been cut off or almost completely cut off. So Venez that does, doesn't that hurt the United States as well? It does hurt the United States, yes. So how, it does hurt, it does hurt uh, oil refiners in the United States, which have now had to look for alternative sources of oil, which come from farther away, it's more expensive. Uh, also, the Venezuelan uh, oil company requires um, NAFTA, which is a dissolvent for the very high, Fine. very high grade oil that they, they have, heavy, heavy oil that they have in, in Venezuela. And they were purchasing most of this from the United States, so they now had oh, to. So they lost that business as well. Yeah, they, they had to look for other sources, like from India, from Nigeria. But this takes longer, it's farther away, it's more expensive. So they, they are, the sanctions are having a real impact on the Venezuelan uh, economy. And uh, Trump, by the end of Tuesday, when he was very frustrated, the coup was not going ahead, he said he was going to implement a complete blockade and embargo of Cuba because he says that Cuba is supporting Venezuela and therefore he wants to take measures against uh, Cuba. So they, they still have quite a lot of measures that they can take. There was also talk uh, earlier this week that Blackwater, the private mercenary company, had put out a proposal for recruiting a mercenary army of 5,000 people to intervene in Venezuela. All these options are on the table. So I would say the Venezuelan revolution is still in danger. We should campaign for, and the one basic slogan, hands off Venezuela, let the Venezuelan people uh, decide their own future. Uh, cool, man. Um, yeah, if there's anything else about Venezuela you want to add in before we wrap up? No, I think that's about all. Just, just to say, this is a basic principle. The Venezuelan people should decide their own future without, free from imperialist uh, intervention, and we should stick, stick by that. And we should uh, bring our own government to account because uh, the, the, the UK, although it's not playing a key role in the, in the coup, is, is only a secondary, uh, second-rate imperialist power, but they are also involved in the coup. Uh, Jeremy Hunt has uh, supported uh, Guaido. Uh, the UK Bank of England is uh, withholding 1.2 billion uh, dollars in, in Venezuelan gold. And uh, in fact, the Venezuelan revolution was, uh, it still is, an inspiration for all of us who want to change society, transform society, so that society is in the hands of working people. We, we working people produce all wealth. We should be able to decide what this wealth is, is used for. Venezuela introduced free education, free university education, free health care for all, uh, housing for the poor. And these are things we can learn from in Britain, a country where millions of people use uh, food banks, where millions of people can get access to decent housing, where students end up the university years with a massive student debt, where the NHS is being starved of funds, where nurses are committing suicide because of overwork. Uh, we also need a revolution in uh, Britain. Uh, on one occasion, President Chavez said, that the best way to help the Bolivarian revolution in Venezuela is to carry out a revolution in your own uh, countries. And um, just about a little bit about you, um, what's your particular um, reasons for being interested in Venezuela? Yes, uh, I'm, I'm originally from Spain, I'm not Venezuelan uh, uh, at all, but uh, since the, for the last 20 years, particularly since 2002, when the coup in Venezuela, we organized a solidarity campaign in uh, Britain. We, we thought, first of all, that the media coverage of Venezuela was completely awful. It was full of uh, li straight lies, misinformation, half-truths, and we needed to fight against that. That is our duty to be in solidarity with people who were in struggle in this country and in other countries. The working class is just one class internationally. A victory for our side in Venezuela is a victory for our side here. And a defeat for us in Venezuela will also be a defeat here. So that's why we got involved. Uh, I have traveled, me and other members of the campaign, we have traveled often to Venezuela over the last 20 years. We have built direct links with community, popular, working class organizations in, in Venezuela, women's organizations, peasant organizations. And uh, so we have brought many of them over here on speaking tours. And this has solidified our feeling that we, we need to be in solidarity with Venezuela. We need to defend the Bolivarian uh, revolution. And uh, uh, defending 
revolutions in other countries is part of our struggle here as well. Okay, man. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, you're Contemplate everything From Yalgo Benjamin yeah. 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 Man say it straight, man don't listen to BBC Man don't listen to ITV Tony Marks, I produce my man, has no effect on climate whatsoever The so-called physics of back radiation denies the first and second laws of thermodynamics And if you go onto our website, you can read about it there and there's no scientific paper in existence which produces evidence that carbon dioxide levels change climate. The fact is the other way round.